Good morning, everybody. It is great to see you. It was good to hear your voices. For those on live stream, thanks for tuning in. Pray this is a time of encouragement and blessing for us all. Uh, ever since kind of the government said one of the restrictions is no singing when we gather together, we made the plan, okay, as soon as that's lifted, we're going to have a couple of special events. And so this Wednesday, as was announced already, a hymn sing in the evening, and Thursday, uh, kind of a contemporary worship evening together. So make sure to come on out to those, and it'll be great to continue singing together to praise our God. I'm seeing a two-week-old baby there. So, uh, yeah, Chris and Patricia, congratulations on little Jace. And yeah, exciting to see. And good to have uh, babies crying and kids running around and to worship together. Last three Sundays, our intern Nathan was preaching. One of the values of our church is to train up people and to give others opportunity to minister. And so it was good to have Nathan preaching and has given him opportunity. And it's great he did uh, such a good job being faithful to God's Word and applying it to our hearts. We've got uh, lots going on as a church with our summer day camps and youth and young adults and worship nights. Let's spend a moment, just pray together, and pray that in all of this that we would see gospel transformation taking place in all of our lives. So let's pray. Father God, thank You that You love us, this world, Your people. Thank You for Your church and us here, one particular church amongst the many in the valley, many more in this province and country and world. I pray that in all of our activities, in all our efforts, in our life, in our day-to-day -day moments, whether we're at work or at home, resting or playing, may we recognize Your worth, the value of Jesus. I pray that we grow as a church to love You, to love the world around us. We think of families in the community of Lytton, and yeah, just displaced in the fires. Think of destruction and just... The difficult world that we're in, Father, I pray just for our province, pray for our government that they continue to lead us well. And uh, think of opportunities we have in our own homes with our neighbors. Teach us to be a people who love, sacrifice, and reach out. Think of our kids and youth ministries. May you speak to many families and kids uh, that they may be transformed. As we look at your word now, may you do a wonderful work on our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. I got to enjoy some holidays the last few weeks, some camping on the beach with the family, a few different mountain trips. And uh, last, Sunday, I was, last Sunday, I was playing hooky from church as Nathan was preaching. We were up in the mountains for a three-day trip, and the heat wave was on, right? And so we knew, okay, even though you're high up in the mountains in the snow, it's still in the mid-30s, so we got up at four in the morning. And it was weird because I was cold, I'm wearing my jacket, I'm wearing my toque. And then we stepped out from behind the rock where we were at in the breeze to the other side, and it's just this pocket of heat. And that was what the day was like. We were climbing up the glacier, and the wind was blowing, and it was cold, and you put on a jacket. The wind stops, and it's just hot. And it was interesting how throughout the day, motivation levels kind of rose and fell with the thermometer. When it was cool and it was breezy, you're like going up the hill and ready for the next mountain and we did this whole ridge and it was fantastic. And then when it comes calm and you're just sweltering and the sweat's dripping off the brow, it's like, get me out of here. I'm done. I just want to sit down. And near the end of the day, we'd climbed three mountains already along the ridge and then we had to kind of descend this whole glacier and cross this snow field under the rock face. And there was one more mountain. We're like, well, let's go get that one. We were energized. Why were we energized? Because the temperature was down at the particular moment. And so, at the top of the mountain, we sat down on the ground, the snow field, and it just carried us all the way to the bottom. It was fantastic. That's the easy way down. That's how I like to do it. So we're freezing cold by that time because the snow is just blowing in our faces, and we're like, yeah, let's go get the next mountain. Let's go get the next mountain. And the breeze stopped, and we had a couple kilometers of just traversing the snow field and the heat. Not a breeze at all. And when we went past the route where we were going to rope up and go up the next mountain, we said, no way. Back to camp. 
motivation levels just plummeted. And that is really what life feels like sometimes, isn't it? Things are going well, everything is in your favor, work's good, relationships are good, and you're like, woohoo, I'm on top of the world. I'm energized, I'm ready to go, Jesus loves me, I can do all things through Christ, this is wonderful. Something difficult comes along, and it just takes the wind out of your sails. Like, oh, I'm all alone, nobody cares for me, I don't know if I can keep going, I'm so discouraged. And then something good happens, you're like, okay, I've got this. Are you like me? You're just up and you're down, and it's like, how do you do it? We're coming to a saying of Jesus. This summer, we're going to have a series, and it's called The Sayings of Jesus. Every week, just a different, you guessed it, saying of Jesus. And this week, we're going to look at John chapter 14, where it says, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Everything's coming wrong, the heat's blaring on you, and you're just discouraged, and you're down, and your heart gets troubled. And Jesus says, no, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, and believe also in me. I think I was nine or ten years old. Our church had a Bible memory program. You had all these different levels to go through and each level had kind of your subsections and you memorize your John 3.16 and you memorize your Jesus wept and all these other passages that are easy to memorize. And then at the end of a little section before you get your prize, which is a $10 gift certificate to the Christian bookstore, I wanted to buy a new CD, um, there was this big passage, John 14, 1 to 6. I'm like, six verses? I don't know if I can memorize six verses. But I wanted the prize, so I sat down and I got to work. And since memorizing that passage, it's been dear to me. It's a beautiful passage. And so let's read John 14, 1-6 together. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in Me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that, if that were not so... What have I told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the place to where I'm going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. A few famous verses here, right? Great sayings of Jesus. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. And it's interesting how verses, they can become familiar, and then when you stop and you read it a few times, Something I didn't really pick up before is Jesus just kind of says to us, don't let your heart be troubled. That struck me this last few weeks as I've been mulling over these verses because sometimes I'm like, but I can't help it. Right? I, I just kind of get carried along. Things are done to me. How on earth can you say, don't let your heart be troubled? Right? When the temperature rises, I get discouraged and lose motivation. My heart gets troubled when hard things come my way. And you're just simply saying, don't. Don't let your heart be troubled. It's almost like Jesus is saying, yes, your worries are strong. Yes, difficulties come against you. But you're not helpless. And sometimes we've got this view of emotions that they control us. It just comes our way and we just bow to our emotions. Watch any movie and someone, the eyes of a guy and a girl meet, and there's this spark, and they just have to follow their emotions. And often it's like, well, it doesn't matter if they're married or not, there's this emotion here, and they need to... It's like, no, we aren't slaves to our emotions. We aren't helpless, but rather we have a helper. And often we assume there's no control over our emotions, and with that, we just get swayed back and forth, whatever comes. 
Yet doesn't the Bible teach us about a self-control? It says we can grow and have an anchor so that we're secure. And so Jesus says, don't let. And in saying don't let, He's saying you have a measure of control and of power. You're able to do something. So, first time swimming this year. Went down to the river. And we looked across, and there's a little beach across the river, and so my daughter and I are like, okay, let's swim over to there. But I uh, forget about the current, right? And I know how to swim, but I'm not a strong swimmer, and so I start swimming across the river, and all of a sudden it's like, I'm not going to make it to that beach. Like The current just takes me, and it sweeps me down the river, and uh, pretty soon I'm almost doggle paddling back to where I came from and have to walk back up the shore. But when we went up a ways, and then we, in the middle of the river, there's this tree sticking out, and you grab onto the tree, and the current's going all around you. But when you're secure, when that anchor's there, and you're just kind of hanging onto that tree, the current can keep brushing by, but it doesn't take you with, doesn't take you with it. Why? Because you're hanging onto something that's secure. By myself, I can try and swim around in the water, but it carries me along. And Jesus is saying, don't let your hearts be troubled. You need an anchor. You need something to secure you. You can try and say, well, I'm just going to control my emotions. Oof, you get swept down the stream and you're like, oh, that didn't work. I'll try harder next time. We need an anchor. And when Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled, the word heart, it's used over a thousand times in the Bible. And it's used to refer to the whole of who you are. The core of your emotions, your will, your being. It denotes your physical, your emotional, your intellectual, your moral. Everything about you. Who you are. Don't let your heart, don't let the very core of who you are be troubled. And, and troubles come, don't they? There's many examples of troubles. Good Friday, we had the walkthrough of the church in different stations moving us to the cross. In the one room, there was a big pile of rocks. A few friends and I went down to the river and we loaded the whole pickup truck with all these rocks and we washed them all off and we loaded them in the room. And those rocks represented your burdens. And as you were journeying to the cross, you took the felt marker and you wrote on a rock your various burdens. Where do you think all those rocks went? I had to take them back to the river afterwards. And as I was hucking them out of the back of my truck, I'd read the various burdens, family troubles, relationship troubles, financial troubles, health troubles, and uh, worries, and kids, and grandkids, and jobs, and the well-being of others, and all of the burdens that were represented on those rocks that you took and you carried and you laid it at the foot of the cross, our troubles are many. There are so many difficult things in this world. The list is exhaustive. It encompasses Anything, everything. Our burdens are real. Our troubles are real. As Louis Armstrong sings, nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. And we all have troubles. There's troubles that are coming from without. And we've got troubles that are boiling from within. Now, a special note, when Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled, He's not just burying his head in the sand and saying, I'll just be bubbly and happy all the time. He's not saying ignore the difficult things of life. Just a few Sundays ago, we spoke about lament. That deep cry of grief over the brokenness of this world. Jesus, he wept. He went through the full range of emotions. And so when Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled, He's not saying life's not going to come and smack you down, knock you over. Yes, there will be times that are incredibly discouraging. But regardless of those times, especially in those times, what are you going to let your heart do? Are you going to let your heart free just to get swept up and carried away by those troubles? We have something to hang on to. Now this is a negative command that Jesus is giving. Don't let it happen. You don't always see good parenting examples in the grocery store. Right? And the reason is because parents are shy to actually parent their kids there. They want to do the real lectures at home and all the good teaching. And so when a kid is crying, what do you sometimes hear? 
Cut it out. Stop crying. Enough of that. Is that helpful? Little toddler crying? Stop it. Not very helpful. So when Jesus says, your heart's trouble, cut it out. Right? Stop it. Don't. That's not what Jesus is doing. Because He doesn't just have a negative command. He now switches gears and He gives us a positive command. He says, replace your trouble with trust. Don't let your heart be troubled. Now it's easy to say that. Oh, okay, I won't. And then something comes my way and whew, I'm troubled again. But he says, replace your trouble with trust. He says, you believe in God? Believe also in me. The antidote for a troubled heart is belief. And belief is powerful. All in and of itself, belief is a powerful thing. You watch the movies? You get all the kids in the world to say at the same time, I believe in fairies, I believe in fairies, and all of a sudden the fairy has power to do its thing. Like The movies are telling us belief is powerful, but that's not the type of belief that Jesus is talking about here. A Christian belief is very different than that. And yet, even belief, just a generic belief, any type of belief in something, anything, is powerful. And that if you believe in something... It helps settle your heart. It almost doesn't matter what you believe in. Now don't hear me wrong, because Jesus is going to tell us a belief that matters for eternity. And there's a movie I saw in high school called Life is Beautiful, and it's World War II setting. There's a father and his son in the in concentration camp. And the father plays a game with the son, and he says, all those guards, they're going to give us lots of rules, and they're going to pretend to be mean, but this is all a game. And he's like, we're not really in prison. It's just a game that we're playing. And whoever wins the game and follows all of the rules, they win a tank at the end. And so there's the son, the prisoner, people around him, suffering, dying. And what does that belief do? Believing it's all a game? It settles his heart. It gives him peace. It lets him see good things and joy. Belief is powerful. Now, it's been a long, long time since I watched that movie, but I don't think there was a happy ending. And uh, belief can help you in the moment, but does it help you ultimately? And so Jesus isn't just saying, just believe in something and it'll make you feel better in your troubles, even though it's going to end real bad later on. Rather, Jesus is wanting us to have a very specific belief that helps us ultimately. This generic belief, just in anything, helps us temporarily. But Jesus is saying, believe in me, and that will help you ultimately. For eternity. Because His help, the, the sayings of Jesus are more than just a self-help. Jesus isn't just saying, just try and better your life and just believe in something and your heart won't be troubled and you'll be at peace and you'll be comfortable and everything well, maybe okay, maybe not. Rather than a self-help, Jesus is looking to a bigger reality where He's actually looking at the reality of this current world and the brokenness, the struggles that we face, the trials and the turmoil that's all around us. And He's saying, in this broken world, there's going to be a real, tangible, physical salvation that's coming. Not just an escape mentality, but rather Jesus is going to make right the wrongs. He's going to set things right so that we don't get swept up in a current of trouble, but rather He's going to eradicate those troubles. And so as Jesus continues on talking here, He's describing what this belief in Him, why it matters so much. And the reason is because eternity is at stake. So belief is powerful. A generic belief can help you in the moment, but Jesus is talking about a specific belief that will actually change the outcome of the matter and more than just settle your heart. And so he goes on and he says, in my Father's house are many rooms. 
In fact, there's more than enough room in my Father's house for each and every one of you. Jesus says, I'm going there and I'm preparing a place for you. When it's all set and when it's all ready and in my good time, I'll come back and I'll take you to be with me in my Father's house forever. So in this world, you have troubles and trials. Things get you down. They want to sweep you away. But anchor your heart in the knowledge and the security that Jesus is preparing a better place. A place that isn't cursed by sin and broken in this world, but a place of His Father where everything good and right and beautiful and true is there. So when Jesus says, believe in Me, He says, the type of belief that you have in Me is what I'm doing. I'm accomplishing you in eternity that is wonderful and secure and good. And that's why belief in Him is connected to our hearts and the troubles that we have. Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Because right now, these troubles, they aren't even worth comparing to the amazing glories that we have in heaven. And yeah, our hearts ache in these troubles. Jesus isn't saying, oh, minimize your troubles, don't worry about them. No. They bring us down and we lament and we grieve and we cry out, Jesus, rescue us. And Jesus says, that's exactly what I'm doing. And see, you don't have to have troubled hearts because you can trust that I'm doing something better. Specific belief that Jesus is calling us to. Not just a generic, oh, I I believe in God. I think He exists. At least I hope He does. No, Jesus is saying a specific belief. Believe in Him. In Him as a person. And the only reason that Jesus is able to give us a secure future is because He's already accomplished it on the cross. The reason there's brokenness in the world, that troubles come our way, is because this world is broken due to sin. God made us everything right and good, and when we turned our backs on God, everything was falling apart. God says, I'll take away your sin. I'll forgive your sin. And there's Jesus on the cross conquering sin. Jesus rising from the dead showing that yes, indeed, it's been paid for. And now He's ascended to God. He's at God's right hand. He's preparing that place for us in heaven. And He says, that's who you want to believe in. Why? Is He's the only one who can help. He's the only one who can make you secure and to help you, and to lead you. And so as Jesus carries on, He says, well, I'm going to prepare the place. So you know, you know where to, how to get there. Thomas, one of Jesus' followers, he's like, Jesus, we don't know where you're even going. So how do we know the way to get there? Um, can you just kind of share the location so I can plug it into my GPS and we'll just follow the path? Thomas says, Or Jesus lets Thomas know. He's like, you want to know how to get there? You want to know the way? Another famous verse. Another famous saying of Jesus that really deserves a whole sermon in itself. Jesus says, I am the way. You want to know how to get to the Father? Where wrongs are made right? Where everything is secure? Where He is your anchor? keep you from being carried along by the troubles of life? You want to know how to get there? Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. He says, no one comes to the Father except through Me. There's only one way. You can believe in lots of different things. You can sincerely follow many different things. Your heart can be right after many different things. But all of those things, it may help you in the moment, but eternally, they'll fall short. They they won't come through for you. There's only one way. It's through Jesus. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. He says, if you if you know me, you know my father. And from now on you do know the Father because you've seen me, Jesus is telling those who are following him. It's the security, this personal relationship. 
It's not a generic, I believe in God. Jesus says you actually know God because we know Jesus. And so Thomas's question is very practical, isn't it? How do we get there? And turn left after the big tree and then go down the hill and around. Like, how do we get there, Jesus? Give us directions. And it seems like Jesus is being a little bit vague, a little bit of ambiguity going on here. Just, just believe in me. I'm the way. But it's not vague and it's not any ambiguity there. Jesus is saying, no, this is very real, tangible, specific, concrete answer. It's all about that personal knowledge of God. An intimate relationship with Him. Not a distant God that we understand in a scientific way or in a theoretical way, but a personal way. Jesus says, you know the Father because you know Me. How do you know Me? You're walking with Me. You're trusting Me. You're getting to know who I am, My power, and My might, My love, My grace, and as you know Me, you know My Father. And when we think of our hearts being troubled, there are a lot of very specific, tangible tools that you can find to help you in the moment. Read anything on mindfulness on the internet. And they'll give you lots of good tidbits to help you along and to kind of lower your blood pressure and lower your heart rate and to calm you down and to let your heart not be troubled in that very moment. You can have associations with colors and you can count up to five and you can do all these different, different activities and events. But Jesus is saying, whatever technique you follow to try not to have a troubled heart, eventually it's going to leave you empty. Because no one comes to the Father except through Me. If you want a heart that isn't troubled, don't let it be troubled how? Jesus says, walk with Me. Know Me. Follow Me, but believe in Me. And as we believe in Him, we walk with Him, we get to enjoy who He is and the security of knowing that He has our eternity secure so that as trials bombard us in the moment, we can stay strong because we're anchored. We, we can keep our heads up because we're secure. We can, we can not be moved by all of the things that come our way because we know that well, if Jesus is taking care of eternity, surely He can take care of my moments now. So it's very specific. How do you not have a troubled heart? Look to Jesus. Believe in Him. And that'll mean you're relinquishing your own control and power, but you're hanging on to Him. And as you're hanging on to Him, what an amazing life that He has for you. So when He tells you, don't let your heart be troubled, are you going to trust Him? It's a journey. It's a lifetime. It's a moment by moment. Trust Him. And we can kind of evaluate a little bit. If my heart's being troubled, take, take, a, take, a, take stock of what's happening. My heart's troubled. Why did I let my heart be troubled? Do I think God's not powerful enough? Do I think He doesn't care? Do I think He has better things to do? I'm not worthwhile for Him to come and grant me salvation? Turn back to Him. Because Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. So let's read these verses again. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in Me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, I would, have to would have I told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I'm going. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you know my Father. From now on, you do know Him and I've seen Him. Let's pray. Father, thanks 
for the command to not let our hearts be troubled. And if there was just a period there, we'd be left frustrated and hopeless, discouraged. But you didn't end it there. You gave us the solution, which is yourself. You didn't just give us advice to follow. You gave us yourself. Teach us to trust in you. To not let our hearts be troubled, but to rather trust. Thank you for that eternity that you're preparing for us. Thank you that you're the way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.